You've tuned in to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint of Calvary Chapel, Houston. Here's a preview from Pastor Ron of today's message. Here are just two pieces. First, this breastplate. And of course, a breastplate would protect the soldier's heart. And Paul says, that's our faith. Our faith in God protects our heart from the lives of the world and assures us of his love. So we have as a breastplate, faith and love. And we has a, has a helmet, the hope of salvation. And of course, the helmet protected the, the warrior's mind. And Paul is saying as a believer, when you've placed your faith in Christ, you can be assured on the truth that you have hope in heaven. When a soldier goes into battle, they have armor to protect them from the attack of the enemy. As a Christian, you go to battle with the enemy on a daily basis, and just like a soldier, you have armor protecting you. In today's message, Pastor Ron explains how your faith in God acts as a breastplate, protecting your heart from the lies of the world. Furthermore, as a helmet, you have the hope of salvation protecting your mind from the attacks of the enemy. You can be assured of the hope of heaven. Well, let's join Pastor Ron in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 with today's edition of Large Than Life. It is kind of interesting to note that when the church was first birthed, right, in the book of Acts, when the church was established and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, it's the whole world mocked the believers saying, oh, they're drunk, they're drunk. When in the reality is, for the very first time, they were alert to truth, and it's the world that is in a stupor, inebriated by the things of the world. What typifies the world, we're told right here, spiritual darkness, spiritual slumbering, spiritual Darkness. What a tragedy. And, and that's not to, to make fun of people. That's, that, it's actually it should break our hearts because we meet people like this. We share truth with them and, and there's a darkness there and they don't even get it. That, it doesn't make any sense. You're not even making any sense to me. Or so inebriated by the things of the world that when we share with them, it, the things of the world just choke. Well, I don't want to do that. I don't, I don't want to follow Jesus. I, I'm enjoying my boat and my house and my things. And, and it's so sad. Maybe you could be here today and, and maybe that's where you've been in the past for whatever reason. Someone dragged you here to church. I'm so glad. Or someone encouraged you to come and, and maybe you're starting to see these things happen around the world and, and perhaps you're seeing the, uh, the reality that possessions just come and go and that there's gotta be something more. There is. There is something more. It's Jesus Christ. He loves you. He cares for you. He wants to give you real peace and real comfort. Not as the world gives, because the world doesn't last long. And in fact, this world is not getting better. That's obvious to everyone. To everyone. So here's the reality. The coming of the Lord, the second coming. It's going to come. It's going to happen. It's reality. We see it happening in the news all around us. But how should we respond? How is the world going to respond? Well, I want you to see this. I want you to turn another passage to the book of Luke. So go left. Matthew, Mark, Luke, those are the first three books of the New Testament. I want you to look at Luke chapter 17. So I want you to see what Jesus said in regard to his coming, what it's going to be like. What's the temperature going to be like? I mean, because I think you're going to see this is exactly what we're experiencing today. In Luke chapter 17, looking at verse 26, Jesus describes what it's going to be like when he comes again in his second coming. He says, as it was in the days of Noah so will also be in the days of the Son of Man. In other words, this is going to be like when I return. And how was that? What was it like in the days of Noah? Well, the people ate, they drank, they married wives, and they were given in marriage. The description is this. In the days of Noah, life went on like normal. Noah is building an ark. God has told him, the world, I'm going to judge the world for their evil. And Noah is building an ark, which is a giant object lesson. It's a giant object lesson. Judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. Look at this thing I'm making. Oh, what are you? It's never rained. What are you talking about? And on and on it goes. And they're mocking him. And they're making fun of him. And they're just going on with life. They're getting married. And nothing's ever going to happen. Until, it says, in verse 27, until the day Noah entered the ark and the flood came and they were destroyed. All of a sudden, when it started raining, they're like, hey, right? Things changed. Peter speaks of this in the New Testament of this event. In 2 Peter 3, 3, he says, know this, that in these last days, people are going to scoff, just like they did in the days of Noah. People will say, where is the promise of his coming? For since the beginning of creation, they may do in this. In other words, we keep hearing about this coming of Jesus. We've heard it before. But for this, Peter writes, they willfully forget 
that the earth standing out of the water came in the water and those who existed perished being flooded. But they forget God judged the earth before and he'll do it again. So Jesus says, just as it was in the days of Noah, it's gonna be like that when I come again. People are just gonna continue on with life as if nothing's happened. And yet we have God's word and we share the truth and they scoff about it. Then he says, it's also gonna be like, look at verse 28, it's also gonna be like the days of Lot. Not just like Noah, but the days of Lot. And look, they did the same thing. They ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. Same thing. Remember Lot, though? Lot was living in Sodom, Sin City. And there was a warning. God's going to judge. Stop. Turn from your ways. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven, destroyed them all. Even so it'll be when the Son of Man is revealed. So as it was in the days of Noah, in the day of Lot, people will ignore, people will mock, but most assuredly, the day came. Now, you can go back to 1 Thessalonians 5, 7. Paul tells us here, when the day of the Lord arrives, it's a day that will hit the world, but the world will be in darkness. The, beer, the world will be in spiritual blindness and spiritual drunkenness. It won't affect them. But, now he comes back to the believer, but let us, that's believers, verse 8, let us who are of the day be sober, alert, attentive, doing what? Putting on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Now, he talks about two pieces of armor here, and we have great detail of the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6. We spent about six or seven weeks looking at this awesome, awesome section. But here, just two pieces. First, this breastplate. And of course, a breastplate would protect the soldier's heart. And Paul says, that's our faith. Our faith in God protects our heart from the lives of the world and assures us of his love. So we have as a breastplate faith and love. And we has a, has a helmet, the hope of salvation. And of course, the helmet protected the, the warrior's mind. And Paul is saying as a believer, when you've placed your faith in Christ, you can be assured on the truth that you have hope in heaven. That's not a maybe or a hope so. Sometimes we think that, well, I sure hope that'll happen. Well, that's our English idea of hope, not in the scriptures. In the scriptures, hope is the absolute assurance of a fact. In John uh, 1 John 5, 3, John says, I'm writing all these things that you might believe that Jesus Christ is God and know that you have eternal life. You can know it. You can have that assurance. You can have your mind fixed on that truth and that reality. The hope of our salvation, knowing we're kept by the power of God, is a great encouragement. By the way, the hope we have, the forgiveness of sins we have, it covers, as one person said, all of the tenses. It covers the past. I know through faith in Jesus Christ my sins in the past, all the things I've done forgiven. It, it's, it's a work in the presence that when I sin, God is forgiving me now, and it's something that's working in the future as well, that I, all my sins covered, and I will be in the presence of the Lord. What great hope. So Paul says here then, we have as a breastplate that covers our heart, faith in God, assurance of love in these difficult times, and as a helmet to protect our mind, the hope of salvation. It's a, it's a fact. And so when you look at these verses that we just looked at, there's a great difference between how the, the believer looks at everything going on around us and the unbeliever. The unbeliever's panic, freaked out. You look at all the things happening around the world. Oh, my goodness. You look over uh, in the Middle East right now. Russia's right on the border of Israel. And into Syria, and all, of course, what's been going on with ISIS, and now Turkey's imploding. The economic market globally is a mess. And then we got to deal with the elections here in the United States. Who do I choose? This person, this person, this person? That? Oh, my goodness, what choices do I have? It doesn't look too great, does it? It really doesn't. And if, and if you're not walking with the Lord, you're panicking. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? I'm not worried about it. I'm really not worried about it. Why would I be worried about it? The Lord's in control. The Lord's returning one day. Hopefully, he's coming to get his church soon. If he's not, I'm going to seek to make as best a biblical and intelligent decision of who will be the next president. But am I trusting in the next president? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I'm trusting in Jesus Christ, right? But if your eyes aren't on the Lord, you can start panicking. Oh, my goodness. And certainly, that's how the world is. we got to fix this thing. we got to fix it. Let me tell you, it's broken already. It was broken from the beginning in the garden. It was broken. And Jesus Christ came to put it back together, to bridge the gap between God and man. You know how I bridged the gap? At the cross. At the cross. 
So now we can have a relationship with God in this fallen world and the hope of eternal life when we pass from here. There's a big difference between the believer and the unbeliever's perspective. So let's talk about the deliverance in verses 9 through 10, the deliverance we have. Look at verse 9. For God did not appoint us to wrath. I find such hope there. I'm not appointed to wrath. Now, there is one appointment that everybody will make outside of the rapture. We talked about it last week, Hebrews 9, 27. It's appointed unto man once to die and then judgment. We've all got an appointment with death. We're all going to keep it. We're all going to keep it. And when we pass through this life, we're all going to stand before God. And he's going to ask one question. What did you do with my son, Jesus? By the way, he already knows the answer. But did you accept him or did you reject him? And listen, the only those that have accepted him will inherit the kingdom of God. And that's the love of God. For God so loved the world, right? John 3, 16, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him doesn't have to perish. No wrath doesn't perish, but has everlasting life. It's a great verse. But he goes on later in that same passage, same context in verse 18. It says, but he who does not believe, I don't believe that, is actually condemned already because he will not believe in the Son of God. So Paul encourages the believer. God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. How? Through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. How is that possible? Verse 10, he died for us because he died in my place. That whether we wake, in other words, whether we're alive when the rapture comes, or whether we sleep, which means we die, either way, as a believer, we're going to live together with him. I love that. I'm not appointed to wrath. You say, well, what about? How, how is that? Where was your wrath taken care of? At the cross. At the cross. Great passage of scripture, Colossians 2.13. God has made the believer alive together with him, having forgiven all our trespasses. How? He's taking it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So all of my wrath, all of my tribulation, all of my shame nailed at the cross. Jesus bore it. I will never see that wrath. I will be spared from the wrath to come. I love that. What encouraging, what encouraging words. By the way, there are some, and I'm going to come a little bit to last week's, but also looking at this passage here. There are some people who think, well, you know what? Maybe the believer will go through the tribulation. But we're told right here, we're not appointed wrath. We're not going to do that. But So let me give you two more proofs. These are from the book of Revelation, that the believer will be raptured before this tribulation comes and then the second coming. In Revelation chapters 2 and 3, we read about the seven churches that Jesus wrote to. These were physical, uh, functioning churches over in Asia Minor, ancient Asia Minor. That's over in Turkey today. But they also represent and illustrate the spiritual course of, her, of church history. In other words, Ephesus, the, the first love church, represented the, you know, the church of the apostles. The church of Smyrna, which is the persecuted church, represented the, the martyred church, the next 300 years of intense persecution under Roman domination. And on and on, you have these churches representing church history. Now, if Laodicea is the last church, that represents the apostate church, then the church before it is the church of Philadelphia. That represents the weak and faithful church just prior to the rapture of the church, the church that we're experiencing today. Now, with that in mind, listen to the words of Jesus to that church, Revelation 3.8. I know your works. I see there's an open door before you that no one can shut, and you have a little strength, and you have kept my word, and you haven't denied my name. And because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that shall come upon the whole world. And many see that then as a promise from Jesus that the church is not going through the tribulation. We're not appointed to wrath. And, and a greater proof than that is clearly looking at the whole book of Revelation as a whole. You have Jesus' introduction in chapter 1. In chapter 2 and 3, you have the message to the church. And the church is mentioned many times. Church, 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 church. After chapter 3, no mention of the church. Not from chapters 4 to 18. No mention of the church. Believers are mentioned again in chapter 19 as they return with Jesus. But chapters 4 through 18 describe the tribulation period. Again, the church is not going through tribulation. We have not been appointed to wrath. So we are delivered. We are delivered. We're going to be in the presence of the Lord, and we're delivered from the wrath to come. 
One last verse, 1 Thessalonians 1.10. We saw it in the first chapter. As believers, we're waiting for God's son from heaven who raised, he, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, here it is, who delivers us from the wrath to come. So we've talked about the day of the Lord. We see the difference between the believer and the unbeliever. We see the fact that we're delivered from this time. So there's one last thing, and that's our duty. Our duty, and this is in the last verse, verse 11. Therefore, here it is, comfort each other. Edify, which means build up one another, just as you also are doing. Now, the word comfort is a great word. It's parakleo, and it means to come alongside and encourage or comfort or edify. Jesus used this same word in John 14, 26 to describe the Holy Spirit. He said there's coming another one, parakletus. We translate it the helper, the comfort who will come to be with you. Now, Paul makes this statement because, again, there were some in the church who thought, well, maybe we're going to go through this horrible time. He says, no, no, no. No, you're going to be delivered from that. So therefore, encourage one another. In fact, if you remember at the end of chapter 4 when he talked about the rapture of the church, look at chapter 4, verse 17. He says, we as believers are going to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we're always going to be with the Lord. Verse 18, therefore, comfort one another these words. So he says, knowing that we're going to be raptured with Christ, comfort one another. And now in chapter 5, knowing that we're not going to experience the day of the Lord, comfort one another, edify one another. Don't be bummed out. Again, as I said, as I see all these things happening in the world, I'm not bummed out. I'm not bummed out at all. I'm encouraged. Every time I see something happen, Jesus is coming soon. See a video like that? Jesus is coming soon. I'm not like, I can't believe that. I'm not like that. The economy's going bad. Oh, I can't believe it. No, Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. That's what we teach our children. Teach them. Jesus is coming soon. Teach them about the rapture. Teach them that these signs are, hey, we've got a, a, a six and eight-year-old, seven-year-old, actually, and we're, we've been watching the Left Behind series. What is that? I want them to know. Jesus is coming soon. It's our duty, and it's our duty to encourage one another. Now, a lot of times, people think that's reserved for the professionals. Well, Pastor, you're the one that's supposed to comfort and edify us, just as you're doing right now. Thank you very much. I'm comforted and edified. But... I can't do that with everybody. You know what? It's the duty of all of us to do that, to encourage one another, and to do that with our neighbors and our friends. They're frightened what's going around. Use it as an opportunity to talk about the Lord and let them know there could be comfort if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. But listen, we're all to do that. In uh, Hebrews 10, 24, it says this, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. That's what we're doing right here this morning. It says this, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the men of some. There are some people who are on church regularly. They're not even doing that. The Bible exhorts us. In fact, it's a sin not to be in fellowship. We are to be in fellowship. Doing what? Not forsaking the assembly of our, ourselves together as some do, but gathering and encouraging one another. Just what he said. Encouraging one another. And then he says this, so much more as you see the day approaching. Hey, Jesus is coming. So guess what? We need one another even more. You know, uh, we have, uh, they mentioned here, out there in the foyer, there's a lot of fellowships that you can sign up and get involved with. Do that. There's life groups. I, uh, my wife and I, we were in a, a life group uh, on Friday night. We are going to a life group. It was great. Our life group centered about talking about this. It was awesome. We were all encouraging one another. That's what we do. I love what Jesus said in Luke 21, 28. He says, when you see all these things begin to happen, look up for your redemption draws near. It's not far away. And so think about how many times Jesus said, and you could look in the Gospels, be ready, be ready, be ready, be ready, be ready. I'll close with this. There was a tourist, and he was traveling uh, the shores of uh, Lake Como. That's over in northern Italy. And he visited a small, privately owned castle called the Via Arconti. And the tourist reached this little castle, and there was an elderly gardener there, very friendly. He opened up the gate to him and, and gave him a tour of the whole place. And the tourist was amazed. I mean, the grounds were just spectacular, so manicured. And uh, he asked the gardener, he says, how long have you been working here? He said, well, 24 years. He says, well, how often does the owner come here? He says, only four times ever. Four times? Well, 
uh, how, do you stay in contact? Well, how do you know what you're to be doing and stuff like that? He goes, well, I get contacted by his agent in Milan. He says, well, has that guy ever been here? Never. He goes, well, that's amazing. I mean, how many tourists come here? He goes, very few. My goodness. He goes, you keep the garden in such fine condition. It's, it's such excellent care of everything. It, you do so as if you expect your master to come tomorrow. He stops and says, oh, no, today. I, I work and I'm ready as though the owner and the master would come today. That's how we should be living. That could be today, that Jesus could come for his church today. Are you ready? Now, here's the thing. If you're here and you're a Christian, it's a possibility that you're not ready, that maybe there have been things that are other priorities. And the reality is, I have to be honest with you, as I interact with Christians, I would say 50% of Christians in the United States are like that. They got other things. There's other things. Where I, got, I got my marriage thing. I got my business thing over here. I got these other activities or hobbies. And Jesus isn't first. I'm telling you, we got to live in such a way that Jesus is first. Then you could do the other things. You can have a better marriage, better family, better everything else. But Jesus has got to be first. I mean, it's all of a sudden when tragedy strikes, all of a sudden they're calling the office. I need counseling, pastor. I need this. Where have you been? Jesus needs to be first. So maybe today... There needs to be a recommitment to Jesus Christ. I mean that sincerely. To say, I'm going to put him first. He's going to be number one. I want to be ready. I want to be ready for him. Or maybe, perhaps, you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, and today would be that day where maybe things have been clicking, things you've, if you've heard in the past. Uh, maybe people have shared with you. You've come here for such a time as this. You're looking at things that are happening in the world, and you say, you know what? Yes. Just as I said to you in the beginning, I'd give you an opportunity. I want to give you that opportunity to ask Christ into your life so that you can have true peace. As I said, during the end of the age, people are going to say, peace, peace, but it's not real peace. And listen, we don't keep treaties in the world. I have to honestly say it's not getting better. It's not going to. It's already broken, as I said. But you can have real peace, a relationship with Jesus Christ. And you can have sins forgiven. So you say, well, what do I need to do, Ron? Can I just spell it out very simply? Listen, it's just being honest with God, saying I'm a sinner. We all sin. The Bible says we all sin comes short of the glory of God. We all do. So it's just being honest with God. That's pretty simple. But it's repentance. That's where the hard part is. Repentance means to turn around. It means I've been doing my own thing my own way, and finally I'm turning around and say, okay, God, I'll, I'll do it your way. I'll do it your way. That's repentance, turning around, turning to God. And it's also placing your faith in him. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So there is faith. It's placing your faith in Jesus Christ, that he is God, that he died on the cross for my sins, that he is the Lord God. And if he is the Lord God, then I'm now saying I want to live for him. I'm not going to live for me. I want to live for him. So I'm going to give you an opportunity this morning, just after we finish prayer, prayer to do that, but let me say this, how important it is, is that you be willing to stand up for him. Because I'm not just talking about faith, yeah, 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 and then you walk out of here and nothing changes. No, real faith, that you're willing to stand up for him, and I'm gonna give you an opportunity to do that today. Because Jesus said, if you confess me before men, you stand up for me, then when it comes time when this life is over, I'll stand up for you. I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father in heaven. And of course, that's the last thing that God wants. The Bible says he wants all men to come to know him, to the knowledge of the truth. And so let's ask God to work right now. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word that we've seen here this morning. We see the reality of it. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to see the things that are happening in our, in our world and place them over the Bible and see, wow, everything is coming into place. And so we want to be ready and there's only one way to be ready and that's living for having a vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ. You've been listening to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint. Pastor Ron is teaching through the book of 1 Thessalonians. The Apostle Paul was arguably one of the greatest Christian missionaries and wrote most of the books of the New Testament. Yet Paul tells the Thessalonians that everything is done by God and through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Paul didn't try to convince the Thessalonians with flattery or fancy language. He merely preached the gospel to them, and it was the Holy Spirit who opened their hearts to accept God's word and transform their lives. Which areas of your life do you need the power of the Holy Spirit to work in today? We'd be happy to speak with you or even connect with you on our website. You can reach us at 281-648-5800. That number again is 281-648-5800. If you'd rather connect on our website, go to ltlradio.org and scroll to the bottom of the page. There, you'll find a form you can fill out to connect. We'd love to hear from you. Larger Than Life is a radio ministry of Calvary Houston and Pastor Ron Hint. To hear more messages like this one, head over to ltlradio.org. You can even download our mobile app to access all of Pastor Ron's teachings. Once more, all you need to know is ltlradio.org. Thanks for joining us today on Larger Than Life.